Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this <clears throat> excuse me, bright blue event as part of our Looking Ahead to COP event series titled Aid to the Rescue, Debating the Impact of UK Official Development Assistance on Climate and Conservation. My name is Patrick Hall. I'm a Senior Research Fellow, and I will be chairing this morning's panel discussion. We're discussing the following key questions. How should UK aid prioritise projects that reduce climate change and enhance the natural environment overseas? How can official development assistance, ODA, be better aligned with the UK's priorities around climate and conservation? Which UK ODA projects are successfully advancing climate and conservation policies? And finally, will projects that reduce impacts on climate and the natural environment also reduce poverty? Here to answer these questions and more is our excellent panel of speakers. But before I introduce them, just to run through a little bit of housekeeping, if you wish to submit questions to the panel, you can do so via Slido, the link to which can be found below this video. Alternatively, you can tweet us using the hashtag WeAreBrightBlue, all one word lowercase, or our Twitter handle, which is at WeAreBrightBlue, all one word. Without further ado, I'll introduce the panel now. We have with us this morning, Harriet Baldwin, MP. Harriet is a former Minister for Africa and International Development. Following her re-election in 2019, Harriet joined the Treasury Select Committee, and she also chairs the British Group Interparliamentary Union, co-chairs the International Parliamentary Network for Education. And in 2020, she rejoined the UK delegation of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Neil Bird is also with us this morning. Neil is a Senior Research Fellow on Climate and Sustainability at the Overseas Development Institute. Prior to joining the Overseas Development Institute, Neil worked as a long-term advisor within several forest departments, most recently in Guyana and prior to that in Belize and Ghana. Danny Sriskandaraja is the CEO of Oxfam Great Britain. He previously led Civicus, the Johannesburg-based Alliance of Civil Society Organisations. Prior to that, he spent four years as a direct director general of the Royal Commonwealth Society. So thank you all to our panelists uh, for joining us this morning for what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, I'm going to hand over to you all to deliver your five minute introductory remarks. And I'm going to start with you, Harriet. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, it's a lovely to be on this um, incredibly well-informed panel. And um, I'm really delighted to be speaking on such an important topic because obviously uh, mitigating climate change has been a key part of the uh, UK's priorities in terms of uh, overseas development assistance for many years, and it's become an increasingly large part of uh, the uh, priority uh, budget. And uh, you can hear there's someone knocking at my front door probably, but anyway, the perfect timing. Uh, but um, it, it, in terms of the budget itself, um, it has increased uh, significantly and uh, it has increased even in a context, of course, of the overseas development assistance budget overall uh, reducing. And the reason for this is obviously we can see how absolutely crucial it is that the UK uh, make a contribution in this area and how crucial it is that this be a very high uh, priority. Um, one of the things that um, the UK has been leading on is uh, financing uh, through some of the international finance mechanisms. So it may not always be um, immediately apparent that this is UK aid. Um, it may, in fact, uh, be coming through one of the green finance uh, funds or other international funding mechanisms like the World Bank or indeed our own development uh, equity uh, vehicle, CDC. Um, clearly, in terms of overseas development assistance, it's always got to put people uh, into the picture as well um, in terms of adaptation to climate change, but resilience and, and bearing in mind that there are so many parts of the country which have uh, uh, or so, much, so many parts of the world which have no access um, to uh, any kind of electricity. Uh, it's been an area where the UK has really been able to innovate. And so, for example, in very uh, rural parts of Africa, being able to provide uh, solar energy that allows uh, you know, girls to continue with their, uh, their homework in the, in the evening and things like that. Uh, it's been a real area of UK innovation. I think it needs to continue to be 
a major priority. And I hope that uh, despite the reductions in overseas development as assistance, that there will continue to be a real focus on some of these areas which are such high impact and so measurable in terms of their impact. Another very um, uh, important area of UK leadership has been on finding cleaner ways to cook. Uh, there are so many women around the world who spend their days going out to actually cut down the vegetation in their area to burn uh, for cooking uh, in a way that poisons them and their families and uh, takes up a huge amount of their day. So the UK has been at the forefront in terms of leadership and developing clean uh, ways of cooking and, uh, uh, and other ways of, uh, of finding alternative sources of energy and cleaner sources of energy around the world. So I'm really pleased to see this continues to be a priority in overseas development assistance, uh, putting uh, people at the heart of the work. And uh, we've already had a very measurable impact in terms of the amount of emissions uh, saved and the amount of livelihoods addressed um, but this needs to continue to be something that we uh, prioritize going forward and continue to measure thank you very much thank you very much harriet and some interesting points there around adaptation and innovation uh, and some interesting case studies as well uh, around clean cooking and solar projects and i'm sure we will um, pick up a little bit more on that when we come to the q a uh, but for now i'll hand over to neil um, floor is yours for five minutes neil Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Neil Bird, and I work at ODI in London. ODI is an independent think tank that works on the many challenges that face global development. My own work focuses on climate finance and its relationship with development finance. And what I will say reflects my own views and not those of ODI. I also recognize that I may be wrong in my understanding of some of the issues that we are discussing today. We are living through momentous times. The 2020s were foreseen as the decade of action that aimed to deliver the sustainable development goals. But events over the last two years have created much uncertainty over what will actually happen next. Long held narratives around international development are under scrutiny. As many of the assumptions of economic growth as understood here in the UK, are being questioned by an increasing number of people. This takes me on to the first point I would like to emphasize, and that is language matters. How we communicate ideas matters. So in my view, the notion of development aid coming to the rescue perpetuates a mindset that is deeply troubling. Parliament's International Development Committee has an ongoing inquiry into the philosophy and culture of aid, which is raising many questions. My second point is a related one, in that it goes to the core purpose of UK aid. We were asked to respond to the question of how should UK aid prioritize projects that reduce climate and enhance the natural environment overseas. However, I would suggest that a first question is needed on should UK aid prioritize such projects? And my answer is no. Aid should focus on providing assistance as directed by the UK's International Development Act of 2002, namely to provide assistance where it is likely to contribute to a reduction in poverty. This question raises an issue that has been hanging over the international climate negotiations for the last 10 years, namely that international support for climate action should be new and additional this was interpreted by many to mean being additional to ODER, but the OECD countries pushed back on this. And today, all the UK's international public climate support is drawn from the ODER budget. This is problematic for several reasons, including that climate actions need to be linked to poverty reduction. This has led to an accounting game where the rules of accounting appear to be both ad hoc and self-serving. My third point responds to the invited question of which UK ODA projects are successfully advancing climate and conservation policies. My own view is that the focus of this question is misplaced. Development assistance has long been mired in the quagmire that is project delivery with its limited time horizons. Unfortunately, this has also become the business model of the Green Climate Fund. You can find over 150 projects listed in the GCF website. 
international climate action appears to be weighed down by a path dependency established by international aid. This takes me to my final point, namely, who is driving this agenda? The framing question of how can ODA be better aligned with the UK's priorities around climate conservation fails to acknowledge the bigger question of how can ODA be better aligned with partners' own priorities. Ten years before the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, there was the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, where the first principle committed donor countries to respect partner country leadership and help strengthen their capacity to exercise it. As a closing aside, in the years when I worked on tropical forest conservation, some UK odour appeared to be spent challenging country leadership rather than supporting it, or so it seemed to me at the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil, for your, your points on communication and um, reduction of poverty uh, remaining the core priority for aid uh, and also around aligning ODA with our partners' priorities. Um, I'm sure, again, we will pick up further discussion on those points when we get to the Q&A. Um, Danny, if I could hand over to you now for five minutes, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Patrick. And thanks to Bright Blue for organising a, a timely debate. And I know we often say timely, but for me, this is timely for two, two reasons at least. One is, you know, I think there was a worry that many of us had had that coming, you know, post-Brexit that Britain would fall prey to a sort of nationalism and we'd retreat or when, when and where we did engage with the world, it would be a sort of in a sort of neo-mercantilist way, trying to strike trade deals at any cost. Or, or there were some who worried that this would be a moment where Britain was going to reinvent, you know, Empire 3, 2.0 and, and, and go into some sort of neo-colonial reflex. But I'm, I think this is a really positive moment for this country to think about its role in the world. And, you know, what we've seen in, in recent months around projecting a global Britain, an integrated view of development, defence and climate policy, I think all that augurs well for what I think is, is a set of values that have been at the core of, of Britain, at least for the last few decades. You know, I have the privilege of working at Oxfam, which has been around for almost 80 years, and to me represents that sort of internationalism and a compassion that's been at the heart of um, of, of British values for, for many, many decades. And I think this is a moment for us to refresh and reboot some of those values. And it's also timely because, you know, today, Car Harriet and her colleagues are going to be voting on uh, whether, um, you know, or when to reinstate the, uh, the legislative commitment to 0.7% of GNI spent on aid. You know, a really amazing commitment um, that was put into legislation by a Conservative-led coalition um, and to me was a high point of what many of us in, you know, who cared about development had been working towards and it would be great to see this government, um, you know, reinstate us back to 0.7 as quickly as possible because it is a tragedy that we are taking billions of pounds out of the Britain's aid budget just at a time when we're, the world is being hit by a global pandemic, when there are more people in need of humanitarian assistance than at any time since the Second World War. And it just, for me, pains me to think that Britain is the only G7 economy that's cutting aid just at a time when the world needs that. Um, in terms of, 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 the, of the debate today, I think um, just by way of introduction, for me, this is this is fascinating because it goes to questions of sort of the quality, the, I mean, the quantity, the quality, the framing and the boundaries of what we mean by aid. And um, I hope we can get into this during the hour, but just to sort of set the scene, I think there's quite uh, clearly a question of quantity. I think I suspect most of us on this call would want to see the UK do what it can to provide the sort of aid resources needed, um, you know, to get, uh, get to, to, to further sustainable development. And I think money does matter and volumes do matter. And I hope we can get back to being a, a true world leader on, on aid. Quality though, I think is, is critical. You know, there have been questions about, you know, what, what is aid really for? And I like Neil's comments around trying to think about the sort of focus on, on poverty alleviation at the heart of what we mean for, you know, by aid on overseas development assistance, or as Harriet put it, putting people first, you know, these are, 
I think they've always been key principles of, of, of what AIDS been about, but now feels like a moment where we need to really um, underline what aid is for. And key to that is the framing. And I, I think I agree with Neil that um, it, it's not particularly useful to talk about, you know, rescuing and saving and things like that, because aid, when it's done well, is part of something bigger that to me is about partnership and a, a joint commitment to sustainable development. And I think framing it in that way is really important. But arguably, the most thorny of these issues is really about the boundary. Where does aid stop and where does climate finance start? Um, and I think, you know, there was a, a really important commitment made by the UK. I can, I've got it here in 2018 in our, in our report to the FCCC. The UK government said that climate finance, it defined as a new dedicated climate commitment, which is additional to historical, historic overseas de official development assistance levels and is not diverted funds from existing development spending. And I think there is a, a really thorny but critical set of questions about making sure that we aren't picking aid pockets to fund climate finance and that we aren't undermining this really urgent goal around poverty alleviation uh, in order to meet the equally important goal of, um, of, of, of climate action. And just to close, I think that those tensions are important from where we sit in the UK and think about UK aid, but they're just as difficult and but just as important, I think, when we think about the sort of, you know, where aid is often spent. And, um, you know, some of those tensions are not easy. You know, how a local community or a local authority balances the need to conserve, let's say, you know, natural heritage and the amazing natural wonders of the world with poverty alleviation, with community development, with job creation, you know, that those aren't necessarily easy tensions to manage. But I think there's a really important thing there about going back to this notion of partnership and empowering local communities, local authorities to be able to make those judgments, hopefully better quality judgments, and using aid as a tool to strengthen those communities, strengthen those institutions. And so for me, done well, um, aid and climate finance can work off each other to achieve, you know, these two equally important um, goals that humanity has to face up to. So let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. And um, I'm pleased that you brought up the um, point around uh, the, the aid cuts, because um, I'd, I'd be quite interested to ask you uh, and Harriet and Neil as well, what do you think the impact of these cuts are going to be uh, for the UK in terms of its soft power status? Um, particularly ahead of uh, COP26 as well. Um, so, Danny, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And uh, Harriet and Neil, please do add any additional thoughts if you have any. Yeah, look, I think uh, before we talk about the impact on soft power, let's, let's also, you know, not pull the punches about the real impacts that these cuts are already having on people's lives and livelihoods. You know, you can just do a search for UK aid cuts impact and you will see you know, development agency after development agency talking about the immediate impact this is already having. Having, you know, I, I spoke to someone who works at a uh, sexual health and reproductive rights agency just the other day, and they were expecting 70 odd million pounds worth of funding to come to them that was already contracted. But with about three weeks notice, they were told by FCDO officials that that money that had already been contracted and agreed and they had planned for will not be coming. And so therefore, Literally, in this case, hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, safe abortions would not be able to happen. Clinics will be closed. And so the sort of human impact of, of these cuts at such short notice at such dramatic scale have really been painful. Um, but in terms of soft power, I think you know, the optimist in me really wants this to be the, the sort of moment of projecting a, 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 a sort of new internationalism of global Britain living up to these best of British values and doing that at the same time of, of cutting aid, you know, the only major governmental departmental budget to be cut, representing 1% of the deficit for this year, these cuts, you know, just at the same time the government is spending almost exactly the same amount on new weapons procurement, it just looks bad um, for the rest of the world and will make it so much more difficult for us all, including NGOs like ours, to be taken more seriously about the sort of commitment to play our role in the world. Thanks. 
Thanks, Danny. Harriet, I'd, I'd be interested um, whether you had any thoughts um, in relation to the UK status as a soft power in light of these aid cuts and also in response uh, to anything that Danny's just said, particularly around um, spending priorities for the government. Yeah, I mean, I'm, oh, I, I, I'm not going to vote in favour of these cuts today. I'm going to vote to try and keep our budget at 0.7. Uh, I think uh, it's important, not just in terms of the lives saved, but also, as the questioner uh, implies, uh, in terms of soft power. Um, the way that the cuts are being implemented is that uh, it, the, the big international uh, pools of funding are tending to uh, continue to get some quite significant allocations and most of the cuts are happening in the UK's own bilateral programs in country. Um, so for example I chair the all-party parliamentary group for Sudan and South Sudan. South Sudan obviously has been a big big recipient of uh, UK aid over the 10 years that it's been in existence as a country. Um, it has some of the lowest human development on the, on this planet um, and there is a lot of um, uh, money that we have gone uh, has gone into South Sudan from the UK um, just to keep people keep people alive, um, they're they're seeing um, you know very significant reductions. Tanzania, where the UK has been a real leader in terms of bilateral funding, uh, I think something like nine out of the eleven programs are just being are being shut. So the soft power impact has actually been exacerbated by the way that this has been um, implemented through the in-country bilateral programs. Um, rather than through the big international contributions. So I'm afraid, I think, uh, even if we move back to 0.7 quickly, it's not going to um, reverse the soft power impact that, you know, for example, the minister in South Sudan saying, you know, what is it we've done to uh, cause the UK to rain down so hard on us in terms of the support that they've been giving to some of our programmes. So I'm afraid I think that damage probably, you know, by and large has has been done, unfortunately, uh, no matter what way the vote goes today. Thank you, Harriet. Neil, I can see that you're nodding in agreement there. Is there anything further that you'd like to add? Uh, perhaps two quick points and, and then a comment, um, please. The, the, the first point um, is the context within which these eight cuts are planned. So the World Bank estimates that 100 million people could fall back into extreme poverty due to climate change by 2030. So the situation is getting worse. Second point, 12 out of the 20 country, countries ranked most vulnerable and least ready to adapt to the effects of climate change are also affected by conflict. So we, we are leading into a, a less stable situation globally. And with the large planned cuts in the older budget, as Harriet says, climate vulnerable countries in Africa are planned to receive far less aid. So I just support what the Danny and Harriet have just said. Thank you, Neil. Um, and just a reminder to our viewers, um, please do submit your questions via Slido, the link to which can be found below the video or on Twitter using the hashtag we are bright blue, all one word, lowercase. I will go now to the questions from our viewers. Um, we have one here from Duncan Garner. Neil, this question is actually uh, directed to you, uh, but Danny and Harriet, do feel free to um, chime in after Neil if you wish to do so. Uh, and it says, government has said in its recent response to the Descupta review that it is looking to consider biodiversity in its allocation of foreign aid. Neil, is this wrong? So I'll begin by saying I haven't followed that particular review. So this is a fairly superficial response. Development prospects have always been seen to be um, set within the confines of the economic, the social and the environmental domains. So clearly a consideration of um, environmental impact uh, should be central to development thinking. So I'll stop there.
Okay, thank you, Neil. Yeah, I suppose what the question is is really trying to get at, just for context um, for our viewers, the Descupta review uh, was a review conducted, uh, commissioned out by the, the Treasury to look at um, the relationship between uh, economics and biodiversity and what types of uh, different policies and measures the government should take uh, to reduce the impact on the natural environment uh, as a result of uh, economic activity um, as a very top line summary of what the review is about. It's a huge document. But um, so um, really the question is around um, the prioritization of aid. And, and I suppose Duncan has, has asked that question, Neil, because uh, in your opening remarks, you indicated that um, we need to have poverty reduction as the key uh, priority for aid allocation. And Danny, I know that you also echoed Neil's sentiments on that. Um, so I'm not sure whether Danny or Harriet, you have anything further to add on that question or Harriet, you do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's obviously very welcome when you can do uh, both things at once. So um, when I was a minister, I saw in Malawi uh, that there was a, a very uh, uh, important project that was um, keeping an area of um, uh, uh, of the country uh, protected for the amazing um, biodiversity and wildlife, but at the same time focused on creating livelihoods around it. Similarly, in Zambia, uh, a, a, a similar project that I was privileged enough to see, which again focused on livelihoods for people living alongside that area of uh, biodiversity. So um, there's so many examples I could cite of where exactly those two things are, are taken into account at the same time um, and reforestation um, you know the UK has helped uh, in Ethiopia for 93 million trees to be planted um, which has obviously created livelihoods but also improved um, of the forestation the reforestation of, uh, of, of so, so much of Ethiopia so um, yeah I think that both things uh, can be factored in very easily in terms of addressing poverty reduction and and uh, preserving uh, the, the environment. And I do apologize for my neighbors annoying building noises in the back. <laughs> That's okay. I think we're all getting uh, used to the background distractions on Zoom after 18 months. Um, Danny, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything further on that point around yes, the please. government's response to the Descripta review. Yes, please. And I've, I've got a neighbor doing some work as well. I don't think we live near each other, Harriet, but you might hear some noise from next door in a bit as well. Um, yeah, look, I think I, my worry at the moment is we aren't even, um, we're not even close on, on the sort of win-win scenarios that Harriet's talked about, because, you know, there is a lot of um, investment, including aid or, or through, you know, CDC type investments, which aren't necessarily doing either, you know, clear poverty reduction or supporting biodiversity and, um, and, and conservation and so I think there is a urgent need to do no harm, to make sure that whatever Britain does in the world, whether it's through aid or other interventions, really doesn't um, you know, further um, exacerbate problems of, of climate change. And I hope that COP26 uh, later this year is, will be a, a, an important opportunity, not just for the UK, but to, for other countries to show, uh, to show their commitment on that. But I do think, you know, I'm optimistic again, that there are there's enough evidence out there that you can square that circle. You can protect biodiversity and achieve uh, impact on, on poverty reduction. And it goes to the heart of the sort of what Harriet was talking about. You know, in, in many parts of the world, that tension arises because subsistence farmers or local fisher folk, um, you know, don't have uh, the wherewithal. You know, they often end up having to, um, to use environmental resources. Um, but there are, you know, examples after examples around the world where interventions have allowed those those communities to be able to, you know, not just use those resources, but protect them and, and sustain them in a way that gives them a livelihood, but gives us all, um, you know, confidence that biodiversity is being protected. You know, I, I was reading recently about some work that we've been doing with partners in the in Burkina Faso and Niger, where you know across the Sahel, one of the most fragile um, ecosystems in the world, uh, agroecology is or interventions based on sort of agroecology are, are allowing those communities, those farmers, to be able to grow crops, um, uh, uh, you know, earn a living, sustain their own families and communities while also regenerating one of the most fragile ecosystems in the world. And it's fantastic to see these sorts of examples. And it would be great for, again, Britain to be known as a country that, that 
you know, is it actively investing in these sorts of solutions? And, you know, I hope that that could be part of what, when people think about Global Britain, they think of us not just as a, you know, responsible player on that, but at the cutting edge, at the vanguard of some of these interventions um, that give us both, you know, poverty reduction and climate action in the same, in the same um, breath. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, oh, sorry, Neil, you'd like to come in. Yes, thanks. If, if I can just say a final comment on this issue. The challenge in development, and it applies equally to the UK as any other country in this world, has always been about understanding the linkages between the economic, the social and the environmental domain. And so let me give you a, a current explicit example. So the huge push in the climate negotiations, which uh, the UK will host in COP26, around climate mitigation, keeping the world's temperature trajectory to within one and a half degrees. Much of the emphasis in climate mitigation strategies has focused around clean energy. That's where a lot of international um, uh, odor and climate finance has been spent, uh, be it in improving uh, energy efficiency or increasing the rollout of renewable energy. But there is, there is another element to the climate mitigation strategy that is only starting to um, reappear in the narrative, and that is around nature-based solutions. And in that context, biodiversity and forest conservation can clearly play a significant role in storing carbon into the future. So that is one means, one element of keeping to the one and a half degree um, strategy. Uh, my concern whenever the, the question of biodiversity is also always raised is that economists have never valued biodiversity in a compelling way. And despite um, 50 plus years of people talking about valuing uh, nature and the contribution it makes to society, it just does not appear in mainstream cost-benefit analysis, which drives many development initiatives. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Um, we've got another question here, uh, which has been submitted anonymously. Uh, it's to you, Danny, uh, and says, have we already seen evidence that cuts to ODA have worsened biodiversity and conservation efforts, perhaps as a result of food poverty? Um, thank you for that. I don't know of any, um, I haven't seen anything that, that makes that direct, direct link, but my guess is that that evidence would be out there. I just have, it hasn't come across my desk. And partly because I think what we've seen in, in this pandemic in um, over the last 18 months are that the sort of the economic impacts of the disruption that we've all had to face um, are, are being felt the most by some of the most marginalized communities in the world. You know, uh, we published a report last week looking at hunger levels. There are half a million people who are in the, the worst level of hunger, what, what's called IPC5 or catastrophic levels of hunger, um, far more than we've seen in recent years, and 150 million people who are in, in sort of famine-like conditions around the world, in, you know, in some of the most fragile environments in the world, in the Sahel, in, in the Horn of Africa, in the Middle East. And my, you know, and that's because, you know, that I, it, it's some fairly obvious impacts, you know, we've had not just cuts in aid, but reductions in remittances, huge flows of income that would have been coming into some of those most marginal co communities from migrant workers who might have been working in Europe or the Gulf, those, those flows have fallen dramatically as a result of pandemic. And of course, you know, with tourism um, um, stalling with, you know, garment orders falling, um, the economic impacts on the livelihoods of people across the world in the global south in particular have faced sort of huge huge disruption and so you could see i suspect what's going to happen in many parts of the world you know the so-called great reversal that that we're seeing in when it comes to poverty is people are falling back into um having to you know eke out a living in 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 in, in whatever way they can and i suspect that is going to put or is already putting 
a huge pressure on fragile environments and ecosystems, whether that's through you know deforestation, whether that's through um, ex, you know demands on 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 other local resources, and so I I do worry about that. Um, and the long-term impact, you know, if you take what Neil just talked about in terms of sort of the impact of climate breakdown on extreme poverty, couple that with um, the impacts of this pandemic on extreme poverty. And we are, um, you know, we are probably looking at a good five to 10 years of um, serious reversals in the amazing progress the world has, has, has seen in recent decades when it comes to uh, poverty and, and, and economic development. And that's really worrying. And it's, and it's not just worrying, I suppose, it's, it's tragic because we can do something about this. You know, the poverty in today's world or extreme poverty in today's world doesn't result from scarcity. You know, we live in a world of plenty. There are, there's more than enough food to feed us all. There's more than enough resources to provide a basic um, set of basket of goods for us all on the planet. And yet we've, you know, we've maldistributed it. We've held back on those sorts of investments, including aid. Um, and so we are sort of sleepwalking into a global poverty crisis, knowing, of course, that we could be acting on uh, to uh, to reduce its impacts uh, today, and um, and doing it in a way that makes the world far more sustainable in decades and centuries to come. Thank you, Danny. Um, I'll just come to both you, Neil and Harriet, if you if you want to add anything further to um, the viewer's question around evidence of the odor cuts having worsened biodiversity or conservation. Do you have any examples examples yeah. of that, Harriet? You're nodding. One uh, that uh, got in touch with me was about uh, one that we were funding um, through Exeter University and the Galapagos Islands to reduce the amount of plastic um, going into that uh, pristine uh, place. And uh, so that was one that was being threatened of, with closure that got in touch with me. Yeah. Thank you, Harriet. Neil, I'm not sure if you had anything further to add on that question. Um, you do? Yep. Yes, if you'll allow me just to, to broaden it um, back to important um, principles that Danny mentioned in his introduction, namely the balance to be achieved between quantity and quality of aid delivery. From my perspective, we spend too much time fixated on inputs. So the 0.7% GNI target is clearly important, but it's what is done with that money that really matters. We spend much less time critically evaluating outcomes. And as, as, as a result of that, the evidence around many of uh, these issues, including uh, this uh, immediate question, is simply not there. It may be there within uh, government systems, but for those outside government, the information is sparse and incomplete. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. And I've got another question here for you, actually, which, uh, again, another person has anonymously submitted. Um, it says, Neil's point that ODA should lift people out of poverty is correct. So could ODA create markets for nature-based solutions to solve both climate and poverty? The short answer is yes. <laughs> the much longer question is how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way that um, responds to the needs of people on the ground? And it gets back to points that both Danny and Harriet have made. You know, at some time, we need to cut through the, the global speak on development aid. What we're talking about is people's real lives. And some of the areas where biodiversity uh, challenges are most acute are in the most disadvantaged, vulnerable parts of this world, where uh, they're even often outside the, the realm of national governments. So <laughs> this idea that um, aid can quickly address some of these issues I would question, and that's why my own view is that 
it needs to respond to nationally determined priorities and how you move beyond a government-led statement, which may be well informed and advised by international advisors to, to the needs of people living in the country is deeply problematic. And I don't think we have yet uh, got systematic um, answers to that question. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Harriet, I'm not sure whether you wanted to come in on that question around um, ODA creating markets for nature-based solutions to resolve both um, poverty uh, and climate or and bolster climate resilience. Well, I do, I do think that's um, incredibly important. I think I cited some examples earlier of, uh, of the kind of things which not only preserve nature-based solutions, but also create uh, um, livelihoods. Um, there's another strand of work that the UK funds, um, which is to do with making sure that what is grown is as nutritious and as um, uh, a, you know, a wonderful crop as, as possible in terms of its impact on the environment. So whether it's an, an improved uh, kind of maize or um, rice that um, is more resilient and nutritious, you know, those are the kinds of things that um, uh, uh, do a combination of uh, improvements in terms of people's um, nutrition, their livelihoods, and also the environment in which the crops are grown. So, um, you know, the UK does fund uh, through a, a variety of different organisations, a range of initiatives which have, uh, you know, been really world leading in terms of their impact um, and um, hopefully um, will be preserved in terms of uh, some of the cuts that are currently occurring. Thank you, Harriet. Danny, did you want to come in? Uh, just a brief point that, you know, there is something like three quarters of the world's poorest households uh, rely on subsistence farming or, or fishing um, to earn their livelihoods. And that's particularly important because I think it, it underlines the point for how climate change itself and climate breakdown is just going to make those people's lives even harder. And, you know, we're already seeing that. I mean, I, and, you know, we're seeing that across the world in so many parts of the world that Oxfam works in that the impacts of climate change are real and they're, they're already happening today. And they're hitting the world's poorest and most marginalized the hardest and, and rather unfairly because they, of course, had the least to do with climate breakdown. So that's the case. But it also means if you flip it, flip the logic, you say, well, you know, but if there are solutions that can um, help those farmers, those fisher folk, those communities, um, you know, manage those resources better um, to have market based systems that give them sort of economic agency and economic power as well as resources, um, then we we address both of the issues that we're trying to tackle right at the same time. And it can be win win. And it goes to the, uh, you know, again, if you focus ODA and make sure that ODA is used where it can, uh, you know, leverage its impact the, the most or whether it can unlock the greatest change and look at the output as, as um, or the outcome as, as, mm -hmm. as Neil suggested, then that's, that's great. But then you might also then say, well, how can we use climate finance to double down on that, to really invest? And that's where I hope coming out of COP this year, we'll see much more um, serious commitment to financing adaptation, hopefully through loan, through grants, not just loans, um, and potentially, you know, really urgent work being done on, on um, and commitment to loss and damage and financing and helping developing countries, poorer nations, um, sort of have the resources that they can make those interventions on, on climate adaptation and finance. So that's when, you know, at its best, you can really see how aid and climate finance um, can, can work off each other. Um, and, and as I said, you know, make a real tangible difference on people's lives. And, uh, you know, starting with 75% of the, of the poorest households in the world and, and giving them a sort of a better, safer, more secure livelihood uh, is an obvious place. Thanks, Danny. Um, we've got quite a controversial question here, actually, from uh, Gina Hansen, uh, who says, can the panelists give us an example of um, overseas aid projects which are harmful to both the climate and the natural environment? And could we offset environmentally harmful projects which we give aid to uh, in another way. Um, I'm not sure, I might go to you on this one, Harriet, if you have any examples in mind. Otherwise, um, Neil or Danny, um, feel free to add any thoughts that you might have. 
Um, I'll give you, um, you know, the the the, the view that um, uh, you know we shouldn't be funding the kind of projects that lead to example for a lot for to a lot of deforestation to put in. Um, palm oil uh, crops, for example, um, you know, those are the kinds of things we should, I think we should avo avoid. There was a controversial one uh, that um, CDC uh, did in Virunga in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where there was an existing uh, palm oil um, uh, forest uh, that had been planted a hundred years ago and um, had uh, was brought back um, into productive use. So in other words, it wasn't for clearing more forests, but was bringing in, um, uh, bringing something back into productive use, which I thought, you know, was a good thing to create livelihoods in that part of the Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, but was nevertheless, you know, one of the controversial projects in the, in the portfolio. So I'd put, probably put that as an example. Thank you, Harriet. Danny, did you have anything further to add on that point? Yeah, I mean, Oxfam does a lot of work with water around the world, and we are still seeing, uh, and by the way, I would support Harriet. I mean, some of the investments we're still seeing coming out of agencies like the CDC, we are, we are worried about. Um, but, you know, on our sort of day-to-day -day business around water, I think we can see that, you know, some of the, the, the sort of us, um, usual solutions that are deployed in, in, in context, you know, like trucking water, for example, to communities that don't have access to water can make sense if you've got a large, you know, displaced population that's sprung up in a place that doesn't have a water supply. But in many parts of the world, we see that being run for months, years, in some cases, it's not sustainable. Um, it involves a lot of um, energy, a lot of waste. Um, and of course, it, it adds a huge price to some of the poorest communities in the world. And so, you know, whereas you know, I, I had the uh, privilege in some ways of visiting Yemen, you know, the country arguably facing the world's worst humanitarian crisis at the moment. But I say privilege because I got to see, visit a, an Oxfam project which involves um, piping water. Um, uh, you know, it's a very fragile water table there, but piping water using solar power rather than you know, thousands of, of, of gallons of, of diesel that had to be used to pump this water up before. Um, much less waste, much less energy, and much cheaper water for those people who need it. And you just think to yourself, you know, that's a sort of sustainable solution that can, um, that can help. And where you know, I really hope that countries like the UK can be, can be a world leader. Uh, and, and on the second part of the question, just to say, you know, uh, offsetting is, is hugely important, but it's another area where that tension between action on, on poverty and action on climate can sometimes come up against each other because, you know, what we don't want to create is in a rush to offset our own, you know, carbon expensive lifestyles here, we start competing for land, for example, because we're trying to visit, you know, plant forests or in, in some of in place parts of the world where we may need to use land in different ways if we're going to achieve poverty um, goals. And so those tensions really do exist. And it's another reason why we should see, you know, alongside the sort of uh, mitigation, you know, we need urgent action here in the global north to reduce our, our, our carbon impacts. Um, as well as urgent action in the global south to provide, you know, to um, pay for uh, for adaptation, and we can't just assume that we can afford to just sort of keep burning carbon at the rates that we do because we can somehow offset it. Um, it's it's already causing some tensions, and um, it's un it's only going to get worse if we don't manage it quickly. Thank you, Danny. Some uh, some interesting points there around our competing priorities. Neil, uh, you want to come in? Yes, and, and in response to Gina's um, important question to us, I'd like to sort of step back and say, you know, we should acknowledge that all of UK older interventions are designed by highly skilled staff within the FCDO, what was then DFID, often in, all, in consultation with national partner governments and often with other development actors. And core to that design work, which inevitably means that project deliver, delivery is not immediate, are environmental and social safeguards. There are systems in place to minimize the likelihood that such projects will lead to harm. Now, now, now that's not to say that 
very occasionally it may happen. But the bigger picture is we should have confidence in much of the present system is very much aware of these dangers. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> We've got a question here on uh, in relation to climate migration, which I know strays a little bit uh, from the topic of ODA, which says, uh, how can we adequately be how can we be adequately prepared uh, for the impact of mass migration due to climate change? Um, so I might go to you on this one, Danny. I think it would be it would be interesting. I remember reading um, a couple of months ago um, a policy memo that came from the European Union talking about how uh, to avoid uh, an on uh, a wave of migration coming from Africa uh, that um, policymakers couldn't deal with that um, we should be providing um, more uh, overseas aid um, to targeted areas to, um, to bolster climate resilience and prevent the need for prevent people from being displaced in the first place. So, um, so yeah, interested in your thoughts around uh, how we can be adequately prepared for climate migration um, in, in decades ahead. Yeah, no, thank you. Look, I remember um, about 15 years ago, um, hosting a conference on climate and displacement in London, it was the British Library. Um, and people were sort of questioning why it was there were people were, you know, we were talking about climate displacement in the way and there were lots of numbers being thrown around about, you know, millions or tens of millions of people being displaced as a result of climate breakdown. This must have been 2005, 2006. And most people in the audience sort of probably left their, their left it thinking, scratching their head going, yeah, that's all a bit doomsday, you know, we won't be there. Last year, Oxfam published a report where we looked at the global displacement by due to extreme weather related events, right? So floods, droughts, forest fires, and calculated that over the last decade, something like 20 million people a year, that's someone every two seconds, was was forced to move as a result of extreme weather related events. And these are extreme weather related events that we know are happening more frequently at a greater scale because of climate change. So this isn't about sort of people who are living at the margins of subsistence who are having to leave because, you know, the drought is getting more severe and more regular or, you know, the levels of water in the water table are lower or, um, you know, that that's something that's harder to calculate, but we also know that's real. And so I think that that um, that is where we we are seeing um, the, the impacts of, of, of climate change already. And, um, you know, I, last year or so, the year before now, when the climate marches were happening here or across the world, um, there were two young people from Malawi um, who work with a partner of ours um, uh, who came to the UK and fact we took them to a whole bunch of political party conferences to meet MPs and other policymakers and they were out at one of these marches and lots of young people in Britain were um, carrying placards that said save our future and Isaac and Jesse from Malawi said well you know we want someone to save our today because they live in Malawi where in a part of Malawi which is already now more drought prone than it already was um, where you know, they and their uh, other students in the school were having to miss days of, of, of school, weeks of school sometimes, because when it did rain, it rained heavier and there was more flooding and school was shut. Um, and that many in their community were starting to worry about, you know, being able to live where they currently live and were starting to migrate to other parts of, um, of Malawi to more urban areas, which placing even more pressure on, uh, on, on those bits of, of, um, of Malawi. And so, that relationship between climate breakdown and, and displacement, whether it's due to extreme weather events or whether it's just it's because people's, people are finding it harder to live um, a, a sort of a, um, a safe, um, secure, economically secure life is happening. And one of my concerns is we don't hear enough about, about that. You know, I, I'm really happy about the fact that we talk more about climate than I had even imagined we would be you know, just a few years ago. This has really climbed up the public agenda in a helpful way. And opportunities like hosting COP, I think in this country, have also you know, raised the agenda even further. But the bit we don't talk enough about are the bits that this question, I think, highlights or you know, that, that sort of where, where, where poverty, that nexus between poverty and climate um, or poverty vulnerability and climate. Um, 
where we need more evidence, but also to bring home the urgency of it uh, in ways that people can understand and appreciate. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. Harriet, I'm not sure if you had any uh, thoughts around um, how policymakers can be adequately prepared for climate migration. And I think this question is not just speaking um, to the UK. I think it's, it's more in reference to the global north. Well, it's uh, spot on what uh, Danny was saying and, um, you know, very much something that the UK um, government takes into account in terms of their long term uh, planning. And certainly before the pandemic hit, um, looking at uh, the way in which the part of the world which probably has the fastest growing population in the Sahel, so the area of Africa from northern Nigeria up to the Mediterranean, and how um, incredibly vulnerable that area is to uh, climate change, the expansion of the Sahara and so on, and recognizing that it's already happening, as Danny says, you know, the, the traffickers that you see going across the Mediterranean, um, if you go to the camps at Calais, you'll find that uh, many of the people there will have made that journey. Um, and, you know, the very sad fact is a lot of the people who are most vulnerable will be uh, the ones who are too weak and vulnerable to actually uh, move, but that there will be traffickers in particular who will exploit um, those who are strong enough and uh, have the money and the resources um, or perhaps, you know, are women who are being uh, trafficked into the sex trade, for example, um, and they will be the ones who will be uh, drowning in the Mediterranean, drowning in the channel, being exploited by these dreadful criminals. So um, it's already a, a, a something that you can see if you look at the population projections and the way um, in which that interacts with climate change, you can see that the, the the Sahel is the particularly vulnerable area and that that migration route up into Europe and then, uh, you know, potentially onward into the UK is one that will continue to affect um, young people and, um, you know, all of us who live in the UK in the years to come. Thank you, Harriet. Neil, I'm not sure if you had any further thoughts around um, climate migration and our response in the global north to that. Yes, just a very quick additional point to make. This issue can be framed in terms of movements across borders between countries, but it is also a critical issue within countries and the movement of people within countries. And what the evidence seems to be showing is it is uh, reinforcing an, an already existing trend of moving to cities, to urbanization, and it's an urban issue, issues, or it is urban issues that start to be put under pressure. So my stand back general point would be, perhaps we need to see a shift in much of the thinking on, on development and older, and a focus away from the rural space to the urban space in the years to come. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Neil. Um, I'm just mindful of time here. We've got one minute to go, and so I don't want to uh, go over time. I don't think we'll, we will have time for another question, which is unfortunate because we, we do still have uh, quite a few. But um, I think we'll, we'll have to uh, leave it there. But thank you very much, Danny, Harriet, Neil, um, for appearing uh, on the panel today uh, and for your discussion. It's been really interesting. And um, on behalf of myself and the viewers, thank you very much for your time and have a lovely day.